Let's stand and let's really sing it with all our hearts. Praise our I want us to open our Bibles this morning in 1 Kings chapter 19. That is 1 Kings chapter 19. We commence reading in verse number 1 of this passage of God's Word. 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's open the Word of the Lord. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and wherewith how he had slain all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. 
and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And as he arose and did eat and drink, he went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Amen. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Just let's bow in prayer. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we ask of thee that thou will bless us as we open the scriptures now and study and meditate upon it. We pray that thou will truly bless us as we think upon the life of thy servant Elijah. We pray that, O oh God, that as we glean here in this field, that thou wilt, our God, make this passage a blessing to our hearts. Lord, challenge us afresh, we pray, as we meditate upon thy word. And, O oh God, give us direction and instruction for the journey ahead. We pray for the infilling of thy Holy Spirit. We pray that thou wilt come thyself and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I wonder in your life, has there been a time that you've been so discouraged or so despondent that when you go to sleep, you wish you never would wake up again? I wonder if you've ever been in the grip of despair. Has doubts and fears assailed you? And as far as life was concerned, the joy of life seemed to have gone out. And maybe there's somebody here this morning and say, well, listen, that couldn't be me. My friend, let me tell you, that could be any one of us. Only for the grace of God himself. Because I want to turn you to this passage, 1 Kings chapter 19, to one of the greatest men of one of the greatest servants of God, Elijah the mighty prophet of God, the man who was used mightily of God, and yet we find him in this chapter 19, sitting down under a juniper tree and wishing that he would die. In actual fact, he prayed that God would take his life. And as we look at Elijah under this tree, friend, you know, many of God's people, I believe, could identify with Elijah here. There has been a time of discouragement in your life. You have been in a place of darkness within your soul. And here we find God's servant just lying down exhausted and weary from the battle that he had been involved in, and he wants to die. I want us to remember just exactly who this man was. Elijah was a mighty prophet. He was one of the great heroes of the Scriptures. In actual fact, you read the Word of God, he accomplished so much for God in the short period of time that his life is recorded in the Scriptures. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we have him there on top of Mount Carmel. He faces the prophets of Baal. He faces a, a, a king that's angry and hates him and despises him and would take away his life. And here we find him standing upon the Mount Carmel, and he repairs the altar of the Lord that has been broken down. He lifts his eyes to God, and he cries to God to answer by fire. He mocks the prophets of Baal, and Baal himself, that false god. And friend, you read the Scriptures and you find that God answers Elijah's prayer, and God sends the fire from heaven, and the people cry out, the Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God, and many hearts of the people turned back unto God that day. Then Elijah took the prophets of Baal, the 450, and he slew the prophets of Baal. He was a giant of a man under God. And then we find that he goes to the, he sends his servant to the mount, and he asks him to go towards the sea and look towards the sea. 
And the servant is wondering, what am I going to see? He said, look for a cloud. Because remember, for three and a half years, there was no rain in the land of Israel. Israel was under the judgment of God, for Elijah prayed that God would humble this people, that God would break them, that God would turn the hearts of the people back to God. The servant goes to the, to the sea, and he looks out there, and he sees nothing. He goes back, and on the seventh time, he comes back with a message to Elijah. And Elijah says, what do you see? And he says, I see a cloud. It's the size of a man's hand, just a little cloud. Elijah was encouraged what he heard that moment because he knew that that was a token from God, friend. That was a token of blessing that God was going to answer, that God had answered his prayer, that God was going to send the rain. And so we find that God did send the rain. And in verse number 44 of chapter 18, it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And Elijah said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. It came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. Here we see the prophet of God, friend, in touch with God. God has used him mightily. God has shut up the heavens for three and a half years, and then God opens the heavens with this mighty deluge. Then the next chapter we read of this mighty prophet, and he's not in the place of victory, friend. He's sitting under a juniper tree. The Word of God says, in verse number 4, chapter 19, And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He sits down under a juniper tree wishing that he would die. You see, my friend, whilst it's true that he was a mighty man, remember this, the book of James says concerning Elijah, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He was just a man. He was a mighty man for God. He was mightily used for God. But what do we see in chapter 19? We see God's servant under a mighty attack. The devil's attacking God's servant. He's attacking God's servant in his moment of weakness. And he's tired, and he's weary, and he's about to give up the battle. And he sits down under the juniper tree. He's under a mighty attack of hell. Matthew chapter 4, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that after 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting, that the devil came to him, and the devil tested the Lord Jesus Christ, that sinless one. Thank God Jesus destroyed the attack of the devil. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Thank God there's victory in the hour of testing. And maybe there's some child of God here this morning, and you have been going through a testing time. You have been going through a trial in your life that perhaps nobody else knows about. Maybe you're just like Elijah. You're sitting there under the juniper tree of life, and you're discouraged in the battle. You're under the attack of the devil. Maybe you haven't seen it that way. But you see that discouragement, friend, that is an attack of the devil against the child of God. Here we, he's going through a wilderness experience. It says there in verse 4, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Are you in a wilderness experience this morning? Is that the experience of your life as you gather in God's house this morning? Let me tell you, Elijah could look back in his life and he can remember the days of victory. He can recall the days of, of blessing and refreshment when there was a fire in his soul, when the spring of the water of life was bubbling up in his heart. And you can remember that as well. But it's not that way this morning. Seems to be that the tide has gone out. It seems to be the joy 
of your serving the Lord, friend. It's not the way it used to be. And you can say with the words of the hymn writer, where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is that soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? And you say, brother, I'm so tired this morning in the battle. So weary, I'm exhausted. Sometimes I wonder, what's the use of going on? What you don't understand is this, my friend, that's an attack of hell. The devil's attacking, and the devil will attack the child of God. Turn with me. Keep your hand there. Turn with me to Luke's gospel, chapter 22, just for a moment. In Luke's gospel, chapter 22, I want you to see another faithful servant of the Lord, because remember, Peter was a faithful servant of the Lord. You say, well, I remember Peter feel the Lord and about the cock crowing and all the rest. Or let me tell you, my friend, don't you forget Peter was the one that was used on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were saved. He was a man mightily used of God. And they loved the Lord. They loved the Lord. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, look with me, please, just for a moment. Verse number 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And Peter said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. Now, friend, just before you judge Peter, I want to tell you, I believe that Peter believed that. I believed at that moment that Peter was willing to go to prison with Jesus, and he was willing to go to death with Christ. He really said that from the depths of his heart. He really meant it. You go on down to to this chapter, go to verse number 50. Let me show you something. And one of them smote the servants of the high priest and cut off his right ear. There's only one that was willing to act to try and defend the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was that one, friend? That was Peter. That was Peter. He was willing to act. He was willing to defend the Lord Jesus Christ when the odds were stacked against him. And Peter was bold and Peter was strong. He stood out there and he took the sword and he took the ear off. Malchus, servant of the high priest. He was in the flesh willing to defend the Lord Jesus Christ. But listen, let me tell you, friend, Peter hadn't reckoned on the power of the devil that the Lord Jesus Christ warned him about the attack. Go back to verse 31 again of that chapter 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired thee to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Notice he said, Simon, Simon. You know, sometimes we don't easily listen to the Lord speaking. And the Lord was warning, and he just said it twice. He said, Simon, Simon. I want you to listen to this, Simon. I want to tell you something. Do you know the devil has planned to destroy you? The devil has a plan against you, Simon. The devil wants to sift you as wheat. As a child of God, he wants to sift you. He wants to test you. He wants to pull you down. He wants to shipwreck your testimony, Peter. The Lord was warning him about that. Simon didn't realize the danger. Rather, whenever the Lord Jesus Christ warned him, he said, Lord, verse 33, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. He says, Lord, I'll go with you all the way. He wasn't aware of the attack of the evil one. And friend, let me tell you, child of God, you just be aware this morning. The devil will desire to sift you as wheat. There are God's people here this morning. And let me tell you, the devil will want to destroy your testimony. The devil will want to discourage you. The devil will want to sift you. He'll want to uh, put you into the testing process. 
And the Lord knew the vulnerability of Peter. And he said this, Peter, the devil hath desired to have you. Now, notice that. There's an encouragement there. Because the devil hath desired to have you. Thank God that says he hadn't got him. He desires to have you. And child of God, let me tell you, the devil will want to discourage you this morning, but here's something to encourage you. He hasn't got you. He hasn't got you. You're a child of God. Now, the devil will desire to have you. He'll desire to, to sift you as wheat. You be aware of that. And there's not a man too big today, but the devil will desire to sift you and to bring you down, child of God. You beware of the attack of the devil. But let me tell you this. The Lord knew the vulnerability of Peter, but thank God the Lord knew the need of Peter. Look at verse 32. He says, but I have prayed for thee. But I have prayed for thee. Yes, the devil will desire to sift you, but I have prayed for thee. Friend, tell me who, who won the battle. We've got the answer in verse 32. When thou art converted, not if, when. And that word converted means, that's not salvation. That means when you're turned back, when you're turned again, turned again to the path of obedience. He says, when? The Lord's saying, Peter, let me tell you, the devil's not going to get the victory here. And thank God this morning, God's on the throne. Maybe you are depressed. Maybe you are discouraged. Maybe it seems that the light has gone out of your life and there's the joy. You've lost the joy. And my, the old devil says, you know, there is no hope. I've got you. You just remember this. The Lord's got you. And in John chapter 10, he says, and none shall pluck you out of my hand. And God, you're safe in the hand of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that the devil will not attack you. And it doesn't mean that the devil will not come against you or try to pull you down. Notice it says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, when thou art turned back, that meant, yes, there was a failure. But praise God that the Lord knew the end of the story. You'll be turned back, Peter. I prayed for you. And he says, when you are turned back, notice what he says in verse 32. Strengthen thy brethren. In other words, be a blessing to somebody else. The experience, don't lose the experience. There's some of you are going through the sifting process today. I want to tell you, God will bring you through. And when God brings you through, don't lose. Don't lose the experience. Make it a blessing to somebody else. Be a comfort to somebody else. And tell somebody else that's going through the sifting process, brother, I have been there, but God brought me through. Hallelujah. Be an encouragement to somebody else. Do you know what some of God's people need? Some of God's people need another brother or sister just to put their arms around them in the day of testing and say, I'm thinking of you. I'm praying for you. And friend, there's nothing as precious if you're going through a deep valley if a brother or sister puts their arms around you in love, not as a hypocrite, but doing it reality, and you know it's real. And they say, listen, you're on my heart, and I'm praying for you. And you know, I can tell you, God will bring you through, for he's brought me through. For it's no secret what God can do, what he has done for me. Praise God, he can do for you. You think you could never be there, friend? That you'll never need some brother or sister someday? Let me tell you, Elijah was one of the greatest men of God, and yet we find him in chapter 19. Where is he sitting? Under a juniper tree. Crying. Praying. God, take me away. There go I, but for the grace of God. 
Now let's look, look at the condition here in which Elijah is found in verse number or in chapter number 19. Look at verse number 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba. Friend, he's running for his life. Why? Because he's gripped with fear. Now, this was the same Elijah. Listen, go back to chapter 17. Chapter 17, 1 Kings, verse number 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. This is one of the darkest periods in the history of Israel. And in the midst of all the darkness, here's God's servant. He walks into the presence of the enemy king, friend. He walks into the presence of Ahab, and he announces the judgment of God without a moment's hesitation, without any apprehension, without any apparent reluctance, friend. He simply goes right into the presence of the king without a tremor, without a fear, and he goes right to the point. He's a man with a mission. And when all around him was worshiping Baal, he announces no dew, no rain for years, unless I say it. He's right there in the front line. They're not a tremor, not a fear. You come to chapter 19, it's different. He's running for his life. He's gripped with fear. He's gripped with fear. Now, friend, let me tell you, if there's somebody here this morning and you're gripped with fear, whatever it is, because of some situation in your life and you're gripped with fear, you can see no hope for tomorrow. Listen, here was a man, Elijah, and he could not see another day because Jezebel was going to take away his life, and he was so afraid of this wicked woman, Jezebel. And he was gripped with fear. A friend, there's a wee verse that God wrote on my heart one time when I was in hospital. And I must be honest, when I was in hospital the last time, I was gripped with fear. And I was gripped with fear concerning one machine. And it was that machine that you were taken into and there was, you're completely covered over and it seemed to be, well, I was there once before, and from that experience, I became claustrophobic. And I couldn't be shut in. But I had to go into this machine. The doctor said, listen, we need to get you into this machine. And friend, I tell you the truth, before God, I was terrified. I was gripped by fear. In actual fact, I wouldn't go into the machine. They said, well, listen, we'll send you to Belfast. We'll send you to the Royal. They have got a bigger machine, and you can go into it instead of that. And so, therefore, I headed to Belfast. But before I did, Dr. Douglas came into the ward. Dr. Douglas was just about to sit down, and the wee nurse said, listen, the ambulance men are coming to take Mr. McRae, so you just got about two minutes. Well, you know two minutes is not very good for Dr. Douglas. And Dr. Douglas said, well, listen, I'm going to read. And Mr. Elliot, the Reverend Elliot, was with him. And he says, I'll read just a few verses, and Brother Elliot will pray. He says, I'm going to read, and I'm reading from Romans chapter 8. And I thought to myself, now, here he is, and he's going to read. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, and that's good. That's good. But then he didn't. This is what he read to me. This is what he read. Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8, verse 15. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. God knew that that's what I was in. I was in the spirit of bondage to fear of a machine that would kill me. Because I couldn't bear it being closed down. And I was in bondage. 
And, as, and then Mr. Elliot prayed, and I was taken out. Let me tell you, my friend, God knew exactly what I needed before I went there. And I went the whole way to Belfast, and I went to the place, and the doctor came over to say, Now, Mr. McRae, listen, I believe you're afraid of the certain machine. I said, Doctor, that's true. Well, he said, You know, I really need you to get into that machine. I said, Doctor, but I come the whole way here because I'm not going into it. I'm going into a different machine. He says, Yes, in there, there's the machine that you come up for, but he says, in there is a machine that you really need to go into. And he said, I'm going to leave you for a few moments. He came back, and all I can think was this. You are not given the spirit of bondage again to fear. You are not given the spirit of bondage to fear. And I said, Lord, but I am. I'm afraid. The Spirit of God says, but you're not given that spirit of bondage fear. And I said, God, give me grace. And the doctor just came back and he says, now, Mr. McRae, he says, which one are you going into? I says, I'm going into that one there. The one I was afraid of. And friend, I lay in that machine, and as you see, he came out of it. But I wasn't in the spirit of bondage. I prayed the whole time in that machine. I am not given the spirit of of bondage to fear. I claimed what God had given me. Elijah was afraid. And the Word of God is filled. We haven't time. Listen, the Word of God is filled with fear knots. Be not afraid. I'm told that there are 366 fear knots or be not afraid in the Scriptures. Now, I haven't counted them. I've got to take those who did. I've got to take their words. You know what that means? For every day of the year, friend, and God knew, what about the leap year? <laughs> and God give us the extra one for all the rest of the years, because every day of our lives, God says, fear not. But Elijah was in fear. Notice something else about him. Go back here to 1 Kings chapter 19. It says, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. And mark this, and he left his servant there. He left his servant there. Because let me tell you, there's something happens when discouragement comes, friend. And when you're in the pit of despair, even your trusted friends, you cannot even endure their presence. You just want to get away on your own. And here was a trusted servant. Here was a servant that was with God's child in the day of battle, up there in the Mount Carmel, whenever they're facing the prophets of Baal, whenever they faced all the obstacles. Who was there with them? His faithful servant. Who did he send to see the sea, or to look toward the sea about the token of the promise of God answering prayer? It was his servant, his faithful servant. But it says there in verse... Three, he left his servant there. Verse 4, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. That covered about 90 miles together, friend. And then Elijah's sister, his servant, used to hear. Now, I was reading some of the commentators about that, and some of the commentators said, you know, Elijah was being thoughtful. He had a compassion on his servant because he was so low he didn't want a servant to go out into the desert there, the dreary Arabian desert with him. My friend, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. How did the servant feel after going 90 miles with old Elijah? Having been with him in all those other battles, and Elijah says, listen, you just stay there. Do you remember Naomi, when she was feeling bitter, she said, Ruth, go home. And Ruth says, suffer me not to leave you. I don't want to leave you. Do you remember Elisha? Remember Elijah? Whenever he was going to be taken up into heaven, he was going to Gilgal, and he said, you stay here, Elisha. Elisha says, I'm not leaving you. 
I've come with you so far. I'm going with you all the way. But friend, to be quite honest, it says he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness because that depression and that despair brought a self-imposed isolation. Is it not true that when you're overstressed, even the presence of friends and loved ones can irritate you? Because discouraged people become lonely people. You see, I believe had Elijah allowed his servant to stay, he could have got encouragement, he could have got strength from him. But when people get discouraged, the first thing they tend to do is get away alone. Remember a woman said to me, Mr. McRae, all I wanted to do was just pull down the blinds and shut the curtains and close the door. I couldn't bear anybody with me. Is that your experience this morning? Listen, he went himself, look at verse 4 very quickly, he went himself a day's journey into the wilderness. Can you imagine what was going through his mind, friend? The turmoil, listen. Read verse 4. He requested for himself that he might die. As he sat down under that juniper tree, and he said, it's enough. No, Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. His mind's in turmoil. What brought him there, friend? We read in Matthew chapter 14 this morning, not by mistake, do you remember the Lord Jesus came walking in the water? And Peter said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come to thee in the water. And Peter got up. The Lord said, come. And Peter got up and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And then he saw the wind and the billows. And he took his eyes of the Lord. And he began to sink. That's what happened here. Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel, friend, was facing greater danger. But his eyes were upon the Lord. And he conquered. And here, notice what it says. Just notice a little word. Verse 3. And when he saw that. What was that? What was the, the that? It was what Jezebel said. When he saw that Jezebel was going to take away his life, he got his eyes upon Jezebel. He took his eyes of the Lord. And he caught up with Jezebel's threat, and so he runs away from his life for his life. And that's what happens, friends, so often when we get into the pit of despair. We get our eyes of the Lord. And all we can see is the problem. The despair. The depression. The loneliness. I've got to move very quickly as we come to close. Notice verse 4 said, And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. Mark this, and he requested for himself. Notice that. He requested for himself. No, no. He wasn't requesting for the good of Israel now. He wasn't requesting for the glory of God now. Because he sits down under that juniper tree, there's only one that he's thinking about. It's himself. He's full of self-pity. And requested for himself that he might die. He says, God, take away my life. I do not believe that that was a God-glorifying prayer. Because I do not believe that that is the prayer for God's child. Or that God's child should be praying, except in very unusual circumstances. 
The martyrs prayed that when they were in the fire. And the flames were licking around them. The martyrs prayed, Lord, take me home. Or if a person, friend, is dying, then many of God's children have said, Lord, just take me on home. But friend, Elijah wasn't told to pray this. Elijah wasn't dying. Elijah was in, the, in, in bodily health. He, he, had got, he had got bodily strength. He was mentally strained. His prayer was wrong. You know, he's not the first one that prayed like that. Turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, verse number 14. Moses, the great man of God, and the burden was so heavy upon his shoulders in Numbers chapter 11, verse 14. I am not able to bear this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou dealt thus with me, deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee. Out of hand if I have found favor in thy sight. And let me not see my wretchedness. He asked God to kill him. The book of Jonah. That little book of Jonah, whenever God sent revival, this is a different story. Because in Jonah chapter 4, God turns the city of Nineveh back to uh, Tarshish back to himself, and, and, and God really, uh, uh, Nineveh back to himself, and God really saves. And you know, no, uh, Jonah's angry with God. And in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 3, he says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech you, my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. Ask God to take him away. David said in Psalm 55 and verse 6, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, that I could fly away and be at rest. And here's Elijah sitting under the tree, and he says, God, let me die. But friend, God still had a plan for Elijah. And God still had a purpose for Elijah. Elijah says, Lord, it's enough. It's enough. The word there is, I have plenty. I have a plenty. He cries, I have a plenty. Now, he doesn't say what he has plenty of. He could say, I have a plenty of opposition. I have a plenty of strife. I have a plenty of discouragement. I have got plenty of difficulties. He cries, God. He says, I, I have a plenty. He's so weary. And let's be honest. What's happening here? Elijah's handing in the towel. He's give up the battle. Is that how you feel today? You're tired, you're weary. You want to give up the battle. Verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, Behold, an angel of the Lord touched him. Friend, that angel of the Lord was the Lord himself. An unknown to Elijah in the midst of his greatest need, the Lord was there to touch him. Maybe you're lonely today. Maybe you're going through a very lonely part of your life and maybe you feel that nobody cares or nobody understands. I want to tell you, friend, if you're a child of God, he's with you. He's there. He's there. Now, how did the Lord respond? And with this, I finished. How did the Lord respond? Did the Lord wake him and give him a lecture? Shout at him? Belittle him? No. First of all, the Lord let him sleep because that's what he needed. It says verse 5, 
And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, he needed sleep. And the Lord giveth his beloved sleep. Psalm 127, verse 2. He was exhausted. He needed sleep. And God gave him that. And then it says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel of the Lord touched him. And the word means he kept on touching him. You know, he was in such a deep sleep, so battered by his fears and despondency. He feels so alone. He feels so useless. He's wearied and tired, and he's asleep, and he's in a deep sleep. And the Lord in love, he touches him, but he doesn't wake up, and he touches him again. And he doesn't wake up, and he touches him again. Because he knows he not only needs rest, he needs refreshment. And so the Lord awakes him. And you know what he finds? Look at verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. Where are they? In the wilderness. Word behold is, it's amazement here. It's surprise here. The Lord says to him, arise and eat, but he's out in the wilderness. Was the Lord mocking him? No, no, no. And whenever he looked, he saw a cake, bacon on the coals, and the word there's on the stones, the hot stones. And there are crews of water. Didn't get that in the wilderness. There are crews of water at his head. Listen, the Lord provided for his need. The Lord provided for his need, friend. My God shall supply all your need. What's your need this morning? Thank God God's able to supply it. I wish you had time to go into this verse, end of verse 6. And he did eat and drink. And he laid him down again. And he went back to sleep. Under the eyes of God. Verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came and touched, or came this, again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and he went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. The first time he got a cake, and the second time he got meat. All supplied by God. Now, that wasn't the first time God supplied his need. Do you remember it was at the brook Cherith? And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. And then the brook dried up. And God says, go to Zarephath. And there was Zarephath, there was a wee widow woman, and she had got one child. And she was baking the last wee cake for her son, not for herself, but for her son, because that's all the meal was in the barrel. And then she realized that death was stirring her son in the face. And God provided for Elijah, the woman and her son. My God shall supply all your need. Are you discouraged? Listen. When you feel weakest, the hymns we're singing this morning were in line. 
dangers surround, subtle temptations, troubles abound. Nothing seems hopeful. Nothing seems glad. All is despairing. Even time sad, does it? Keep on believing. Jesus is near. Keep on believing. There's nothing to fear. And even in the wilderness, as he was running for his life, the Lord was there meeting his name. Get your eyes on the Lord this morning. He'll not disappoint you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, that even in days of darkness that thou art still there, thou art the light of the world. We thank thee that thou art the bread of life for the hungry and thou art the water of life for the thirsty. We thank thee we can say, my God, my God shall supply all my need. We thank you, Lord, the words of the psalmist, but I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. We're in your thoughts today. Lord Jesus, we're in your prayers. Encourage your people. Strengthen us for the battle. Help us not to give in or hand over the towel or the sword. Help us to press on. Keep on believing. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.